Godrej. That's us in ruby, green and blue. And this is a story of the little things we do. It started with a little thing we made to protect you and your things. Over a hundred years on, we're still doing the same, except it now has wings. Lift off. Little things that'll take you places you can't get to on an airplane. And little things that circle the earth and tell our farmers when it'll rain. Little things that keep our animal friends hale and hearty. And little things that keep kids healthy and naughty. <laughs> little things that keep not just our homes, but even medicines and vaccines cool. And little things that rinse away dirt and allergens, so your little ones don't miss a day of school. Little things that make washing hands so much fun. <laughs> and some that make your cars and homes smell like spring. Little things that keep diseases away. And some that make your hair shine and swing. Little things that help you make things. Big, small and everything in between. And little things that help carry those things to places far and even unseen. Little things, or should we say little spaces, where you live, work and play. And little things you keep in those spaces to sit, sleep or just put things away. Locks, soaps, buildings and missiles. Well, there are quite a few. These are some of the little things. The little things we do. So, greetings and welcome all to the Godrej Agrovet Hindu Business Plan webinar on what ails the Indian animal husbandry sector. This is Vishwanath Kulkarni, a deputy editor with the Hindu Business Plan, moderator for this webinar. So, animal husbandry has been an integral part of the Indian agriculture and it includes various segments such as dairy, poultry, fisheries, aquaculture, among others. Animal husbandry provides a steady source of income to a large section of the rural populace, mainly the landless, small and marginal farmer. The share of animal husbandry in the agriculture GDP is about 28% and growing. So the growing population, rising income levels and urbanization is driving the consumption of animal protein in the country, fueling the growth for the animal husbandry sector. So milk is considered to be the largest agriculture crop and the total value of the milk now exceeds that of the cereals grown in the country. So recognizing the importance, the government has created a separate ministry for the animal husbandry, dairying and fisheries in 2019 to give the much needed policy impetus. So India has been the largest milk producer for past several decades and is counted among the top five poultry producers also. Despite being the largest producer of milk, the Indian dairy sector has been has seen traditional challenges such as the high cost of production, low productivity, incidences of diseases, quality issues, and a weak export, among others. So the challenges are almost similar in the poultry sector too. In addition to these traditional challenges, both poultry and dairy are now facing some sort of a competition from in the alternatives category. It's a plant-based uh, proteins. To discuss the present state of the sector and the challenges plaguing the industry, we have an impressive line of speakers for the webinar today, and it's my privilege to introduce them. 
we have mr nadi godrej chairman of godrej agrovet and managing director of godrej industries who will be delivering a special address for us so mr nadir godrej is an alumni of mit stanford and harvard business school and has been the director of godrej soap since 1977 he has been very active in developing the animal feed agriculture inputs and the chemical businesses of godrej industries and associate companies in 2001 godrej soaps was renamed as godrej industries and he was appointed as the managing director of godrej industries also mr godrej has been active in various industry bodies including cii clefma among others he is currently the president of alliance france in mumbai and has received various awards including the legion the honor by the french government in 2008 Mr Godrej is deeply committed to the good and green strategies and achievement of set targets for the Godrej group. He encourages and supports a shared vision value for all the programs of good and green. Over to you Mr Godrej for the special address. Thank you very much. Now agriculture's growth is slow and the only subsector that we know with really good growth potential is animal husbandry and it's essential that this subsector should rapidly grow for agriculture to clearly show it can approach the heady growth of the other sectors as both services and industry are known to grow rapidly and without growth there'll be no charm in struggling on at the farm the demand for milk fish meat and eggs stands on very sturdy legs as the population rises and the nation urbanizes women will work more and more and so consumption's bound to soar the people will have time to roam more meals will be outside the home more diverse foods they will taste some vegetarians will make haste to branch out just a little bit and animal husbandry will be a hit and all will find it rather nice that we don't need to raise our price I don't intend to be rude but pulses are no fancy food and yet their price is now so high the truffles to my ever sigh now cereals make for hearty fare they do provide a major share of calories on the cheap and protein at a price not steep alas all cereals nature such their protein content is in much now pulses have a wee bit more but not much more and that's for sure indeed when it's correctly seen as good digestible protein none of the pulses have a lot agronomically they've lost the plot as all their yields are very low and often imports need to flow and yet the prices rise each day no one seems to know the way to get their yields to improve for they are stuck in a groove few plants that grow in the field have a decent protein yield the soya bean is an exception but as a food it meets rejection because of its reasonable yield its protein is cheap while in the field it's not palatable till modified not edible till detoxified and all this adds to the cost much of the benefit is lost and since we aren't allowed to grow varieties that are gmo our current yields are very low we have a shortage as you know this might lead to confusion but for a simple conclusion the answer lies as we will see within our own industry the way to go is innovation quick progress will help our nation at gotrich agrovet you see we've invested much in r&d all our team worked very hard to set up our center ng card in india we have an urgent need to produce efficient feed now rapeseed meal has good protein but glucosinolates are also seen once they are inactivated a nutritious feed is created as soya prices are now soaring this technology is scoring for milk feed conversions low but there are benefits that we know the total cost of feed is low many benefits then flow not only compound feed is fed both fodder 
and feet instead. The room in here is our star, for it can take us very far. Just grass and urea can suffice. These come to us at a low price. The rumen bacteria go into bat and make protein, carbs, and fat. With this alone, we can't succeed. We also need compound feed, especially if yield is high. This comes at a higher cost, but the benefit can be lost. In rumens, good nutrients degrade. Technology leaps to our aid as treatment or encapsulation can prevent this degradation. The nutrients go on their way. Downstream stomachs come into play. Almost all passes through. This world is truly brave and new. High quality at lower cost. So all is gained, nothing's lost. Greater resources, it can be seen, are needed to produce protein. In India, we are rather short. And therefore, all of us now ought to find a more efficient way to produce protein and save the day. In India, yields are very low. This adds to costs, as we all know. More cows are grown, more feed is fed. You also need a bigger shed. And all this leads to higher costs. But something else is also lost. The consequences are very dire, as carbon emissions are also higher. There is a tool that we can wield. And that, of course, is higher yield. Now, normal breeding's very slow. There is a faster way, we know. We asked ourselves what could then be the cutting edge technology. In agriculture, Israel leads. And IVF, Meta needs. Now, crossbreeds are a compromise. And that approach once seemed wise. The compromise that one would see was between yield and immunity. Human nature is always loath to give up something as we want both. Of course, we want the highest yield and Indian immunity in the field. Much better yield from sperm and egg while immunity on another leg. Not from parents, but something other, the placenta of the surrogate mother. Now, NGCARD, our research station, is a fountainhead of innovation with steady progress in newer feed and Maxi Milk's superior breed. We are now sure we can succeed in providing protein our dire need. Though agricultural growth is slow, all of us undoubtedly know animal husbandry's on the rise. It is now one third the size of the agricultural economy. In this millennium, we now see plant agriculture has been troubled, but fish and milk have more than doubled, while the growth in eggs has been threefold, five times as much of chickens sold. Now careful attention should be paid to the percentage growth of the last decade. The plant-based growth, just one and a half. If it weren't so serious, it would make you laugh. But the animal growth was five times more, providing sucker. And we are sure this positive trend will still endure. This is where resources should pour. In 10 more years, we should see that half the agricultural economy will by that time be animal-based the plant economy will be outpaced. For farmers too, there's much to gain. Their over-reliance on fickle grain could lead to farmers losing all. A poor monsoon can cause a fall. But the farmer who diversifies finds that this strategy is wise. With eggs and milk, the income steady. The diversified farmers always ready just in case the field crops fail, his second income can prevail. For the farmer, minimizing debt is surely a much safer bet. For our nation, benefits are seen, the provision of quality protein. Animal husbandry can be planned with a poorer quality of land. Our forex reserves we can replete with exports of shrimp and meat. 
There are many animals we can grow, cattle, chicken, shrimp, we know. But other species are also there. We could greatly increase their share. I do believe it would be wise to support any startup that bravely tries to reach out and to organize the minor species found here and there and support them everywhere. Turkeys, ducks, goats, and sheep, all this and more we can reap. Mullers, crabs, geese, and quail, of many species we can avail. In insects, one already sees the culture of silkworms and bees, but other nations are already steering to widespread insect rearing. The poultry scene is generally bright, but in crises, customers take fright. Whether it's COVID or it's flu, in every wave there is a slew of bad news that's, miscon that's misconstrued. Consumption then gets subdued. We often wonder why, oh why, does demand collapse or die? It can fall and even sink without the slightest logical link. When chicken gunya widely spread, the chicken dunya badly bled. We go through all these crazy antics based on sound and not semantics. The sector's value additions know the farmers that benefits that flow in this commoditized industry, high volatility is what we see. Now profits soar and then they fall. It's very hard to take a call. The big problems that I see are small scale labor intensity. There's a scope for digitization as well as efficient automization. Network effects can overwhelm scale. There are many benefits farmers can avail. Input supply and output sale, reliable advice without fail. The technology of this new age boosts both income as well as wage. Now farmer incomes very low. So how can we make it grow? Yes, doubling income is the call, but this initiative may fall if animal husbandries neglected. So the government has selected two funds to get the sector started. The funding's large and big hearted. And if we get our act just right, the future would be very bright. An end to protein deficiency, high levels of efficiency, new technologies unfurled, exports to the Gulf, and the world. In milk, we already lead. In all the others, let's succeed. Let us be bold, green, and wise. Let us strive and seize the prize. Provide our people with good health and our farmers with some wet food. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godridge, for delivering the special address. A beautiful poetic narration summing up the current situation of the animal husbandry sector and the prospects. So now we'll have uh, the keynote address from Mr. Sodi. Mr. R.S. Sodi is the managing director of uh, Gujarat Milk Marketing Cooperative Federation, which owns the Amul brand. Mr. Sodi has been at the helm of Amul for over a decade now. A graduate of Irma Anand, Mr. Sodi has been working with Amul for close to four decades and had worked under the direct guidance and mentorship of Mr. Vagis Kurian, the milkman of India. So under Mr. Sodhi's leadership, Amul has recorded a five-fold growth in turnover from around 8,000 crore in 2009-10 to over 52,000 crore in 2020. So Mr. Sodhi has set a target to take Amul's turnover to 1 lakh crore by 24-25. And India's homegrown dairy giant is ranked eighth among the 20 global processors under the leadership of Mr. Sodhi. As Mr. Sodhi is traveling and is unable to uh, participate live in this webinar due to the Wi-Fi related issues, uh, he has sent a recorded uh, address. Can we have the recorded address from Mr. Sodhi, please? Good evening. Uh... Honorable Shri Nadir Godreji, Chairman Godrej Agrovet, uh, Shri B. Sundarajan, Managing Director, Saguna Holdings, 
श्री आशीष मदानी वाइस प्रेसिडेंट कॉर्पोरेट रेटिंग्स आईसीआरए श्री संदीप कुमार सिंह सीईओ एनिमल फीड गॉडरेज एंड माय वेरी वेल एंड श्री विश्वनाथ कुटकर्णी फ्रॉम बिजनेस लाइन इट्स अ वेरी ऑनर to speak on this very 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 pertinent topic today i'm sorry that i'm not able to join by uh, live because i'm on vacation somewhere in kashmir so i thought of recording before my this whether i'll get the wifi or not well this topic of what ails india's animal husbandry sector for which today's webinar is i think people on this topic talk a lot people are aware about this topic but some of this is not getting the prominence in the policy maker what it deserves to be i mean we all know we are from the animal husbandry sector i don't want to give you lot of data but we know today the animal husbandry sector is the biggest sector of around Uh, 11 lakh crore per annum, or you can say 150 billion dollars. And among the agriculture, all the sectors, this is the fastest growing segment. I mean, the growth is two and a half times more than the agriculture. I mean, we know dairy is we are the largest producer with eight lakh crore, two lakh crore is fishery, and one lakh crore is uh, poultry, and all growing above five percent. and today animal husbandry sector is contributing around 27 to 28% of animal uh, sorry of uh, agriculture gdp but when you want to develop the sector where the maximum rural households livelihood dependent the budget or resource allocation is done the first thing is we have to make aware the policy makers and political leadership that whatever development whatever central or state budget is there for the agriculture 27 and 28% should be given for the animal husbandry sector because this sector you can also give livelihood people who are landless because agriculture means you need land and other thing i mean in dairy today more than 80% are landless and marginal farmers now when i was thinking last evening about what are the factors which are impacting the growth of this sector because one thing we are very sure and we are very lucky in india market is not problem for livelihood sector thankfully we have got 1.35 billion people and 1.35 billion stomach and with the more income growing prosperity growing consumers are spending more on protein and fat rich diet whether vegetarian or non veg and animal se sector pets sets to that thing the one thing which is very important is how to keep interest of farmers or interest of the rural people in this sector for growing or coming to this sector and that is only possible if they are assured stable and regulatory prices in case of uh, agriculture we know msp is there in animal husbandry sector whether you take dairy or poultry or fish there is no uh, msp and we don't want it but what happens in this is the volatility in the prices little 5% 10% surplus prices crash by 30 40% or little bit shortages then prices go up and you hear the news that imports are going to take place this and that so first is this how to reduce the volatility in the prices so that very stable and remunerative prices are going to the farmers who are in the livelihood sector and i think for that two things are required one is that whenever there is a surplus the buffer stocking should be done by the government the agriculture ministry or the state government and that buffer stocks should be released when the there is a shortage the other area is very very important is the because india is the fastest growing market for the animal husbandry products so whole world especially the animal 
as many rich country whether europe usa new zealand australia they all want to dump their surplus because they are not getting growth to india and that is allowed we are not against imports 30 40 50% of whatever duties but they want india should import at zero duty under fta in their country they don't allow but they want india should allow i think that is the area where at no cost no compromise should be made whether thousands of jobs are offered to the it billions of dollars are other countries are ready to invest in india for automobile sectors or if they want to allow your uh, anything uh, textile or a thing but one should not compromise on the livelihood of the millions and millions like in case of dairy 100 million families are dependent for now what are the factors i think which needs india to improve naturally we can't expect the farmer should get more and more prices every so what is required is how to increase the productivity of the animal or any livelihood sector and anything so productivity can be improved by better feeding and better breeding so what we have found is in case of animal reproduction i mean in case of dairy the major thing is non pregnant dry animals around 17% of production is getting hampered because 17% of the cows or buffaloes have never been pregnant and they are dying and they are eating all the feed sector and burden of resources so if they are provided timely veterinary services and timely ai and others whatever thing, then it is then second is less ai coverage only 28% is the ai coverage in india in gujarat it may be 40% so that can, needs to be increased the third factor which is also impacting productivity is the lower consumption rate because we do not have trained ai workers when the cow or buffalo is heat we are not impregnating them and that is the other area and then delay the in the first uh, intercalving period is for 452 600 days that should, should be reduced and the most important which we have seen in most of the parties delay in first calving the first calving cow should come within two and a half hours two and a half years and buffalo should be in three years but it is taking four or four years or five years for the first calving and reason is that the failure in early heat detection is the one thing the other area i think is uh, uh, which i think needs to be improved is the education i mean for technology we have got lot of engineering colleges and itis and other thing but i think is what is lacking is the trained veterinary doctors in india there i think we need many of veterinary colleges and many itis to train ai workers or invasive worker who can stay at the village and provide the primary animal management and other i think area is is the digital intervention in the animal health i mean in gujarat we are trying that how to improve the digital uh, veterinary services in the villages besides that i think other area is animal nutrition i mean what are we doing we are converting in the villages the left over of whatever is after human consumption to the animal feed and also the green fodder so i think that is the area where conversion ratio to be need to be put we are not advocating the western side of model where you feed the grains and other thing what is required for human consumption our models is low input low output and other i think the other one very important area which i feel for the animal management sector to look into which is impacting the whole world is the attack of plant based fabricated or alternatives to the animal management sector be it the uh, milk or even uh, the mutton or the egg you see number of plant based fake products are coming and these are nothing these plant based products nothing but factory produced chemically made artificial product with synthetic flavors 
and with lot of chemicals and emulsifiers. And if you see the the what ingredient it has got of plant based, not more than six to seven percent. Balance all is synthetic, and price two to three times higher than the natural products. But because of more profitability, they are able to promote. They are able to spend on lobbying. They are able to influence the policy makers and consumers in favor of these fake natural products or fake animalism. Products. I think it is the responsibility of the animalism sector how to make consumer aware about the long-term ill effects of these plant-based products because people have not seen. The impacts of this. Whereas for any present animalism product, we have been seeing how nutritious it is, how useful it is for the body for the last thousand and thousands of years. So, end of this my uh, thoughts. I think animalism is the one sector which can improve the livelihood of Bharat. Animalism is is the one sector which can reduce the disparity between the rural livelihood and the urban family, which is today one is to five. And we need to make policymakers, political leadership, and especially the industry aware about the responsibility of each and every, that where they have to see, and everybody has to see that if we allow good atmosphere of the growth of animal in this sector, we are not only growing our industry, but we are providing livelihood to the millions and millions of other for in the urban India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sodi, uh, for that enlightening address. So we now are going to start the panel discussion. So the panel discussion will be followed by Q&A. So I request all the participants to send their questions into the Q&A box with their name, designation, and the name of the organization they represent. So our panel for the day consists of industry stalwarts and experts from both poultry and dairy sectors. We have Mr. B. Sandarajan, founder and chairman of uh, Suguna Group. A first generation entrepreneur hailing from Udumalpet, Mr. Sundarajan went on to set up the Suguna group of companies along with his younger brother, Mr. G.B. Sundarajan. He currently serves as the managing director of, at Suguna Holdings Private Limited and as a director in its subsidiaries, including overseas companies. Suguna, a market leader in the broiler business in India, is one of the pioneers to start the contract farming in the poultry sector. Mr. Sundarajan's business interests lie in poultry, animal healthcare, and dairy segments. So he has globalized Suguna Group's business activities by setting up business ventures abroad and subsidiaries are located in countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Kenya. Under his leadership, Suguna Foods has provided livelihood to over 39,000 farmers and has been ranked third in Asia's top poultry producers list. The company is also ranked as the ninth largest poultry producer globally. Suguna provides direct and indirect livelihood support to over 2 lakh people across the country through the concept of poultry integration. Mr. Sandarajan has won numerous awards for his works, including the Asian Livestock Industry Award from the Malaysian government. He has also set up the Suguna Institute of Poultry Management, a non-profit organization and a partner in the Skill India program, which trains youngsters in the rural areas, transforming them into the successful uh, entrepreneurs and skilled employees in the poultry industry. Welcome, Mr. Sandaraj. So then we have Mr. Sandeep Singh of uh, Godrej Maximil. Mr. Sandeep leads the animal feed and Godrej Maximil business at Godrej Agrovet Limited. He is one of the founding team members of Godrej Maximil, a joint venture between Godrej Agrovet and Maximil, an Israeli startup with expertise in cattle genetics. Godrej Maximil was set up with the intention of providing the dairy farmers the high quality genetics at affordable price. Prior to his current role, Mr. Sandeep was lead strategy in Godrej Agrovet and a management consultant. Sandeep is an engineering graduate from Mumbai University and MBA from Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies. Welcome, Mr. Sandeep Singh. Thank you. So the third speaker on our panel is Mr. Ashish Modani, co-head and vice president, Ikra. 
Ashi is one of the lead analysts for ICRA's research in automobile, including auto components, automobile dealership, OEMs, and poultry sector. Over the years, Ashish has worked on credit assessment assignments across various sectors like automobile, agri, engineering, poultry, and power sector. He holds a BTEC degree from electronics uh, in BTEC degree in electronics from the National Institute of Technology, Calicut, and MBA from Nasi Munji Institute of Management Studies. Ashish has an aggregate work experience of 14 years, and he has been associated with ICRA for over a period of 12 years. So I would like to start the panel uh, with a question to Mr. Sondarajan. So the industry had talked about you know, high feed costs and all. So now the government has opened up the soya meal imports. So how are you going to leverage this now? How do you, when do you think this will help the industry? I uh, mean, over what time frame you think it will help the industry? Thank you, Chaman. Uh, Now, the currently, only the two borders are open. One in Gujarat and one at uh, eastern part of uh, India. Now, the currently, the materials have started coming from uh, Bangladesh to into our country, mostly for uh, West Bengal, Bigar, what is the uh, requirements it may, it may meet in the shorter period. Because the limitation is uh, Bangladesh also, it's uh, producing for our, their own requirement. They also import the seed and they are crushing locally. Okay. To get it from the Western markets, uh, it will take an about what, uh, 50 to 60 days the material to move in. It may take time. But within that, uh, local soya also it will come from October onwards. But at the same time, I'm hearing about some of the trades that happened at Vietnam who imported the seed. Vietnam and uh, Malaysia, that materials are moving towards India. Through that, partially we can fulfill, mm -hmm. not officially. Okay, okay. Mm. Thank you, sir. So now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sandeep Singh. So low low productivity has been a, a big issue for the Indian milch animals. So how do you think this can be overcome? Like, you know, the government has started a massive exercise on artificial in insemination and all. When do you think uh, productivity can be increased, you know, considering the fact that well, around 50% of the milk so, I mean, the dairy sector is still unorganized. So, okay. What's the time frame you can look at, you know? So. Uh, thanks, Vishwanath, for having me over. Um, on this particular point, uh, let's put things in perspective. There has been an improvement as far as yields are concerned over the last four or five decades. Uh, through the regular routes of artificial insemination, etc., that has been tried conventionally. You've seen some improvement. So where we were in 1961 to where we are now today, there is a 4x jump in productivity. The challenge is it's much lesser than what we need to be and where we should have been by now. Uh, with accelerated breed improvement program, there is a genuine attempt to change the uh, trajectory of this growth. So if the earlier growth was at uh, whatever that rate was, uh, now the rate is going to be much faster because there is a willingness to adopt uh, newer technologies and embryo transfer technology to be more specific to ensure that we move away from uh, the current productivity norms that we have in the country. Having said that, I think uh, we need to realize that in livestock and specifically in cattle, the lead times are very high. Any intervention done today will take at least one hour to three years to show any result in the market. As Mr. Sodi was also mentioning that, you know, your first set of output will be visible uh, two and a half to three years down the line, depending upon you're talking about a cow or a buffalo. Uh, so from that standpoint, a target of uh, a two lakh um, high yielding pregnancies or animals to be present in the country, say by 26, 27, to my mind, won't move the needle. Because uh, look at the numbers. We are, we have a, we are a nation of 300 uh, million uh, animals, of which 136 are female cows and buffaloes, 30, 136 million and the yielders are restricted to some 80 odd million. Now, what would two lakh uh, pregnancies or high yielding animals do in this particular landscape? Uh, so yes, the intent and direction is right. Uh, there is a long gestation. So I think the need for the hour is for us to move much faster uh, because at this pace, uh, one, we'll not be able to make a lot of impact. And second, we are looking at maybe a, a case of, you know, a lost decade again, 
uh, with very uh, regular and secular growth of improvement in productivity that we've seen over last many decades. Okay. Thank you, Samit. So now I would like to uh, ask Mr. Ashish Modani, you know, to share his perspectives, you know, on the challenges faced by the poultry and dairy sector and what needs to be done, you know, to overcome these issues. Thank you, Mr. Kulkarni. Uh, while we all are aware that there are a lot of challenges, but one thing we should appreciate it that uh, the animal husbandry or livestock sector is growing at a faster pace than the overall agri segment. So their, seg their share was somewhere around 25% in uh, overall agri uh, GDP, which is now almost 28%. And we expect it to be crossing maybe over 30% in the next two to three years. So it's very much possible. What has helped uh, uh, this thing is that the government as well as uh, the, there are a lot of private party interest because if you have seen in the recent time, the private equity funding is also coming in, in, the, in the dairy and also you can see in the political space also over a period of time. So the interest is there and that interest is going to channelize and, and improve the overall operation efficiency across the channel. Okay. Now regarding challenges, while we all are aware that there are multiple challenges, we are talking about low yield, we are talking about availability of feed, quality feed, we are talking about availability of financing. So these are nothing new. We all are aware of all these things. But the, there is a stock, still a lot of scope to improve the productivity and yield. Uh, while we're talking about the lack of uh, veterinary uh, doctor, there could be a possibility that you have a mobile a veterinary van in a, in a district which roam around and provide facility uh, to the farmers and villages. We are talking about high level of uh, infections uh, in in our livestock. That can be uh, because government recently come up with almost 13,000 crore uh, outlay with under National Animal Disease uh, Control Program, which is uh, over a four year period. So we are talking about 100% uh, vaccination for food and mouth disease and for <clears throat> in the next four years. Even if we achieve 60, 70%, we are, we are uh, good to go. So we're talking about financing. Financing is a big issue. Like if, if a farmer goes to a uh, bank for, for funding the livestock, while the government has a lot of program, the end implementation is very much delayed. They are like getting uh, a funding for, for livestock is very difficult. And then somehow they have to go to the NBFC or the microfinance institution and they have to pay out 20, 25%. Uh, and they are not able to get the interest subvention and all of the benefits. So financing is a big issue that needs to be sorted out because if you want to improve the overall yield, the farmer should be educated, the awareness, awareness level should be there, and uh, the overall health of his livestock should definitely improve. If, because if the overall yield improves, his productivity improves, he will be able to pay uh, whatever liability he has, he will be eligible for higher financing. And this is a vicious circle. So we have to support that thing. And as and when this improves, I think it's like a juggernaut. We are just waiting for the right thing. But if it starts moving, I think we will likely to see a very, very strong growth uh, in the animal husband sector. We are talking about both in the milk side, on the dairy side, in the poultry, in the seafood. Seafood has a very strong export potential. While they are still working, uh, there are <coughs> uh, the, the problem that we have seen uh, is the lack of awareness uh, at the end level. And I think if that we are able to address those awareness related issues, I think even uh, in the um, several part of country where you don't see uh, much scope, uh, uh, I think the farmers will definitely adopt and they will uh, push uh, this uh, growth in animal husbandry segment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Modani. Uh, so coming back to Mr. Singh, uh, so what's your take on this, uh, the progress of the, the vaccination and the artificial insemination. How, how is that going? Like, you know, so what needs to be done to expedite that? Someone has to see the proof in the pudding. I mean, what have we done to show to the guy that this eventually ends up, you know, de delivering the results? Okay. We talk about, you know, uh, indigenous breed programs, but um, why is the person in animal husbandry business? He's in the business to make money. He has to feed his family. So unless he sees that kind of impact, happening on his, his or her livelihood. Interestingly, dairy farming is something where women farmers are very prominent. Uh, why would they be interested in any of this? So I think uh, uh, AI, et cetera, one, the lead time to see the result is much later. Second, the total impact of this in terms of the improved uh, genetics in the next generation is incremental. Mm -hmm. So what we need right now is a step jump, not an incremental iteration. That is something we've been doing for the last 40 years. And we've not seen that kind of impact. 
there is a reason we have started with 300 million animals and the kind of productivity that we have with that animal is one of the poorest in the world. Hmm. Uh, we talk about being an export house, etc. But at the end of the day, our economics of how the commercials play out don't necessarily make sense today. Yeah. So the important thing is how do you show to the person? And uh, we've been in this business of genetics for a while. Uh, I can tell you with great reassurance, they are willing to pay. Uh, we've not seen a challenge of them not willing to pay or they're playing this, you know, we are poor card equivalent. They want to see the output. They want to see the service, which makes a difference to their livelihoods. They will figure out a way to beg, borrow, or whatever else they have to do to ensure that they are able to pay for technology. Are we offering promising technologies to these farmers, which make a difference to their livelihoods? That's the most critical part. And second, I think over-dependence on governments is always going to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, agriculture anyways falls between, I mean, it's a state subject, but you know the states will tend to define, define it in their own ways. The central government will try to define its own, own way. There is a big role and a room for a private sector to come in and play here. Uh, if we are able to create that value proposition to the farmer, uh, you will see an impact of the same in terms of uh, moving the needle when it comes to animal health, uh, moving the needle in terms of animal productivity. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Um, so coming to Mr. Sondrajan. So, so despite despite being a large player, you know, we still have a very small footprint in the export market. You know, our exports are hardly less than 100 million, you know, in value terms. Considering that you have overseas presence in countries like uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Kenya and all. So what has been your experience, you know, uh, means what needs to be done to scale up the export? What are the challenges there? Indian production is not competitive. It's because of uh, raw material prices. Okay. Now the SM today, uh, two, uh, three markets are exporting the products. Okay. Out of the three markets are, one is a Brazil is a leader. They sell the whole chicken and uh, breast meat. They used to sell breast meat. They used to sell it in the uh, uh, European markets and uh, whole chicken, it will come to mid Middle East. Second, uh, the highest sale is coming from the US. US market is uh, only the predominantly they sell uh, as exposed as uh, liquids. That's the throwaway price is around $950. The material is available. The people are not consuming. That is coming at throwaway prices, whichever is the market. Then the third one is the uh, exporter is uh, Thailand. It goes to Japanese market with uh, as a validated product. Okay. These are the three major markets. For us, is a, a good opportunity we have for the Middle East. Okay. Middle East market, it consumes the uh, huge quantities. They consume everything is coming from Brazil. Now, US also not able to dump it in the Middle East. In the U.S. market, oh, sorry, um, the Middle East market, uh, we are having the uh, good advantages. Uh, Ninety dollars to hundred dollars is the per can. Tan is the tra transportation cost compared uh, compared with three hundred dollars from uh, Brazil. Okay. But our maize and soybean prices both are quite expensive comparing with the Brazilian market. Brazil is available uh, around two hundred ten dollars is at port, but at the same time, if it's going for interiors, it will be around it's available at one sixty or one seventy dollars. So I've been meal at a uh, port used to be around uh, four hundred fifty to four seventy dollars, and uh, if it's going to interior for the down four hundred dollars, it will be available. But for us, it's costing around three hundred dollars is the prices. Sorry, not 300, and about 21,000. It's around 272 $280 is for the main. So I've been, as an, now we are unable to calculate about 1 lakh 10,000 rupees. Is about, yeah. It went up. Yeah. So that's why we are not able to compete. That's the one side is a raw material. Okay. We don't have the domestic market due to that. There is no much processing plants in India. Still, we are selling at around 3 to 4% only in the market, domestic markets. That's another reason. Okay. Third reason, uh, this is not related with the broiler, but predominantly the egg-laying birds are getting affected due to uh, avian influenza issues. Okay. 
we are facing over the last 10 12 years we are facing the problem we are representing to the government worldwide everywhere there is a vaccines are allowed but still in india it's not allowed okay that also to be allowed into the country i seen in the bangladesh in about 4 years back there is no vaccines the last 4 years they opened up the vaccine the, we don't have any problem in bangladesh market mm-hmm. so similar way the india also to be allowed okay okay these are the three major challenges what we are facing so so back to mr singh uh, i think even dairy also faces a similar uh, issue as far as the export is concerned you know mm. so you know the government has to subsidize now and then you know the smp uh, as and when there is a glut in the domestic market to ship out milk powder to the neighboring countries and all so what what needs to be done what's your take on this like you know how how this can be tackled at the industry level so i think this kind of got covered that there is a cyclicality element as far as these commodities are concerned and i think uh, that's the nature of our business uh, to some extent the cyclicality will remain and we no i don't see it uh, it getting completely eliminated anytime soon what can potentially be done is uh, you keep narrowing down the peak and the troughs uh, one big component i think as far as milk is concerned is also to look at how what to what extent is adulteration happening correct yeah. and if you start controlling some of those things i think the uh, demand supply uh, mismatches are going to be addressed uh, more frequently i mean covid of course was a very bad period uh, where uh, we saw a, an extreme extreme reaction where you know a lot of milk government was completely stopped the prices of milk fell through and then there was a mandate given to uh, the cooperators to keep buying in the market and then uh, an export incentive was provided while this is good uh, to ensure that the farmer keeps on getting an income it does distort the industry structure once in a while uh, so how do you ensure that there is a, a fair play between all the stakeholders of the industries what will uh, what will be critical i think one uh, critical component to solve for would be the quality of produce uh, our neighbors uh, uh, happen to be bangladesh and they are a big importer of smp i don't think indian companies or india per se uh, would have a great market share in that smp import while we can talk about the fact that you know um, there is an import coming from new zealand and we can't match that on a price basis if this has been covered if bangladesh is part of safta and so is india and why can't we go and have those specific conversations around you know milk powder is something that you need we have excess of this and let's partner together so that we solve for it on a more regular basis so uh, these knee jerk ad hoc reactions need to make way for more streamlined structured export policies and that's where i think we will be able to manage the situation much better within the country also okay thank you mr singh so so mr mudani um, i would like to have your views on the export so what needs to be done like you know a third party uh, perspective like you now so for, for the both the sectors what do you, how do you think it can be scaled up uh, see uh... our understanding and our discussion with several participants suggest that we don't have, we don't have infrastructure see one is uh, mr sondarajan has clearly talked about the the competitiveness so one is that we are not able to have uh, uh, the cost structure the feed is very very costly second is uh, you are hardly there let's say talking about poultry you are hardly there in in the in the process market we are india is largely a live bird market and you don't export live bird and for for export you need to have a very strong cold chain infrastructure uh, and a very a pure logistics uh, in, in in place i think we are not we don't have that kind of infrastructure in place while that is supporting also because because of uh, absence of such infrastructure we are not importing also despite its wto related uh, 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 commentary we are, there is hardly any imports in india but uh, cold chain is a big issue and i i think unless until that is getting sorted out uh, we will not see any meaningful exports from india be let be it be uh, a, a poultry market or even in the uh, dairy segment also thank you mr modani uh, so so now this question is for both mr singh and mr sondar rajan so so in addition to the traditional challenges you know the new challenges are on the Uh, the plant based alternatives and all that also there is a renewed uh, interest uh, you know among the government also has come out with some programs you know to develop the indigenous breeds and and there is a uh, especially in the poultry also there is a uh, renewed interest in the backyard poultry also 
So how do you think this will pan out, you know, on the organized segment? Like, you know, what's your take on these issues? Mr. Sandrajan first. So the, uh, really, that's a challenge. Now the genetic pool worldwide, it's a consolidated into two companies as of now. Yes. For an India type of the countries, we need a local breeding. What we believe is a local breeding, which is a climatized for India type of the countries. Okay. So the local breedings are in future is a must to protect ourselves. And another, another is a climatization based on Indian needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So any initiatives being taken up, you know, for the local breeding per se? In poultry, there is a two, three companies that are doing it in India okay. at all our very early stages. Okay. 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 So Mr. Singh, over to you, like, how do you see these uh, challenges? So, uh, I think I'll segregate this into two, three parts. On the plant-based protein part, I mean, Personally, I had more pockets of this material, uh, the plant-based meat. And the reason I did not go ahead with them was the sheer quantum of sodium put in that. Right. So while we uh, give it a quote of quote unquote a healthy uh, alternative option, one needs to be very mindful of what is healthy for what segment, correct? Because if we start consuming that quantum of sodium on a daily basis and considering the other Indian diet, we, we are headed for a huge hypertension problem in future in this country. So I'll wait and watch and see how this uh, category uh, pans out. Being an industry player, of course, we need to be very mindful of where and how this competition is coming and how will we address the same, right? So I think if uh, sustainability, uh, being environment friendly is, uh, is what needs to be addressed, I think the industry is doing in uh, some bits of this and will do more of it to ensure that we become, uh, uh, we are in the same consideration set of this set of consumers who want to look at this as a trade-off. The current price points obviously don't seem to indicate that. Egg still remains one of the cheapest source of protein in the country. And in a lower to middle income country like India, I think that is where it will remain uh, for a large part of period. So we are potentially looking at 0.1 to 0.01% of uh, protein demand shifting in this form. We don't mind that. Let's see what comes from that in future. On the indigenous breed part, I think, um, the intent is great. Uh, we need that diversity in a nation like India. Uh, also, the reason why indigenous breeds were succeeding because of disease tolerance, correct? Now, uh, with the crossbreds, etc., the disease tolerance was on the lower side. Now, this is something that can be addressed with genetics. If you're already taking care of that in genetics and the yields are much higher, the dairy farmer is in the business of making money. They will make the switches automatically. So the market forces will decide which way this goes. Unless we are talking about a segmented supply chain where some of these indigenous breed products are sold differently and there is higher remuneration for the farmer. If that is not in play, then of course uh, the high yielders uh, from whatever breed that comes from is where the farmer will eventually go because that's where uh, profitability will be much better for the farmer. Okay. So I have one additional question on this. So, like, You think genetics has a role to play in ensuring a better quality milk, like what role can genetics play? Genetics can, so yes, answer to that question is yes. Okay, because uh, uh, while in India, this data bank and this database is not readily available, uh, globally, uh, this kind of database is available where you can choose uh, that what sort of animal would you want to breed in the country, right? So that can help you control, uh, come to a set of animals or a set of cows, which gives better fat percentage, better... So uh, SNF percentage, or for that matter, uh, lower disease incidences, right? So that kind of directionally that is possible to be achieved. But of course, we are just starting the journey. So I think uh, that this is a decadal story. This will play out over the next decade, decade and a half, when we will eventually have uh, better quality milk coming through genetics. But this is not genetically modified cows. So I don't see anybody having a problem, a problem around this then. Okay. And how, how, do you, how do you see the emergence of uh, this organic and uh, A2 milk? You know, you think that can emerge as a bigger segment in the industry? I think not many of us would have ever believed that in India, there, were, there will be a set of consumers who are willing to pay 100 rupees per liter of milk. Okay. So I think uh, for the food industry and for dairy industry, this is great. 
that there is a subsegment getting created which is willing to pay a top up premium much higher than what the rest of the country can afford to pay okay uh, as we prosper as we grow i think the ask on quality is what is going to determine this premium uh, and hence the investments that we will have to potentially make as an industry is in our supply chains uh, and trying to create traces of where our milk is being bought and processed from uh, okay. the more, more we do that uh, the more assurance we are able to give to the consumer that this is a high quality milk with, without being touched etc then that's where the premium will come from and i see the segment growing i think there are many uh, success stories the ones who failed here are primarily the ones who did not have the right back end in place otherwise uh, uh, with a strong supply chain operations uh, procurement uh, infrastructure in place uh, these businesses will keep growing okay okay i mean i don't think as a nation 10 years back we were consuming as much cheese as we are consuming now and uh, this is a classic case of how we are moving in our own uh, dietary habits okay fine so so with that uh, we'll uh, start the q and a session so we have uh, the first question from mr uh, from dr gajendra bhangale so indian animal husbandry sector services have been frequently blamed for producing food of animal origin with higher antibiotic residue which even sometimes restrict us from exporting to some first world countries in reality a major part relies on the high prevalent quackery in veterinary services this issue has seldom seen to be considered by the state regime how can we address this to exploit the full potential of our animal as well as get higher returns from the farm exports so mr singh can you uh, take up this question please yeah sure so uh, as we were discussing that state subject basically means that you are dealing with then um, a lot many more regimes and trying to convince all of them so this this is something with which the uh, uh, respective industry forums will need to do uh, convince the uh, the state government regimes to be more proactive in this i think part of the problem is the depth of talent that we have in this space uh, and hence we need to start segregating that what level of intervention is where we need masters and uh, doctorates and for what level of intervention we can actually work with paravets and other uh, other subsidiaries so i think there is a whole spectrum of talent pool that is needed uh, which is more on the ground available uh, solving more basic and specific problems i think as long as, uh, as we get access to that part of talent pool we should be able to address this and uh, make ourselves more competitive okay the other part would be investment in technology so in last i think as part of goodrich agrobet we also interact with lot of uh startups it's been very heartening to see in uh, last 5 to 15 months that a lot of extremely talented individuals are interested in solving some of these uh, challenges uh where the solutions are more tech more digital uh and hence uh, there is hope and belief that uh, we will have crack to some of these quality related issues that we face today and they will get solved digitally or te- through technology when we crack the uh, the remoteness of our uh, business okay so so the second question is from an anonymous attendee so so why not to explore providing live and processed bird at cheaper cost to indigenous customer so can uh, mr saundarajan take up this question please again we have to go back to the raw material only okay <laughs> highest impact is of why we are not competitive as on today whether productivity parameters or input costs input costs are more expensive mm-hmm. even in future it is going to be more, more impactful because the broiler feed broiler cons- uh, consumes around 19 million tons and layer it consumes around 14 million tons okay it alone it's a need around uh, the any grain uh, put together all put together around 22 million tons is the total grain requirement mm-hmm. then other needs as a food fuel starch and other industry all put together maybe a, uh, more than a million ton, uh, 10 million tons okay already we are 32 million tons is a, more than 32 to 35 million tons is a maize is required but we are producing around 24 25 million tons okay the same thing with uh, any proteins also protein requirement for the, the same now but as on today my estimate it says around 7 million tons is the protein requirement for a poultry feed alone okay then we have to consider for other proteins okay 
this industry is a growing a lot in about 78% level it's a growing the same level of the growth i'm es- estimating for our next 10 years also such a case in 2030 our requirement is going to be double okay where are we going to get even whether is it going to be from india the problem is uh, india productivity is not increasing or uh, land area also not increase mm-hmm. okay that uh, to solve we need a genetic modified material it had to come into india for a higher production and very uh, the farmers also they can produce more and uh, it's economical also for the industry and for farmer so otherwise uh, we cannot manage every year we have to depend on imports okay even that uh, that will be quite serious from the next year onwards itself. already we are running shortages okay so in coming days it's going to be year on year it's going to be very serious matter okay okay thank you mr sandrajan for that so the next question is from dr tm gauri shankar see the current technology adoption in dairy in feeding and breeding is much lower in our country how are we going to make the indian dairy farmers aware of scientific breeding and scientific feeding methods there is a very urgent need for skill development and education how the different stakeholders say like the government cooperatives and the private industry can contribute in this critical area so mr singh uh, can you answer this question please i think uh, the central government is quite serious about it uh, we've had many interactions uh, with agencies in uh, uh, delhi where uh, where the in, uh, the entire intent or seriousness uh, that needs to be attributed to the fact that uh, both breeding uh, feeding and breeding need to uh, move to the next level in terms of its sophistication at the dairy farmer level uh, that uh, awareness is there uh, there are a lot of programs that the government has already announced on the same lines i think uh, th- there is uh, that's why we actually have a program like accelerated uh, uh, breed improvement uh, program otherwise something like this would not have happened earlier as far as awareness level is concerned i think leaving it as i was saying that leave, i mean there are a lot of stakeholders and all have to play their respective parts uh, leaving it only to the government to say that it's your job to do it will not be right and hence there is room for a uh, private sector to come and do this partner with the government if the need be at the same time uh, we need to start segregating the science into two parts more repeated business as usual science need to be uh, need to move to uh, a, a potentially a lower skill set uh, talent pool which is more widely available which can spread out across the country and do that technology can play a role here um, okay. we are experimenting with a chatbot where we are trying to see if a chatbot can start answering a, a frequently asked questions of the of the dairy farmer uh, and then we are obviously collecting that data to see what kind of challenges farmers face on a day to day basis and how can we solve for that so i think uh, yes I, i agree to the point that awareness levels are low but at the same time uh, i think there is a significant serious uh, seriousness in terms of intent and action from the government side there is a role for private sector to play and technology will be the uh, uh uh the the disruptive component here which will ensure that the speed of spread of this is much faster than what it was in last 30 40 years education has seen that disruptions it's a matter of time that uh, something like our sector or our field also sees a similar model coming in and disrupting the dissemination of information okay so we have uh, next question from uh, deepa anand so i would like to uh, direct this question to mr modani so how would the future protein requirement is to be addressed will insect pro- insect derived protein be an alternative so mr modani do you think insect derived protein will have a chance in the indian uh, palate See, we are at a very very low base over there okay. so when you when you are in a segment which is a low base you are always have a scope for growth okay but if you're talking about the uh, absolute growth where it's going to come it will still come from uh, the uh, key segment which is dairies uh, poultry and uh, uh, fisheries and we are uh, we should look at the numbers absolute number we are hardly anywhere th- the other markets uh, we are talking about the yield we are talking about uh, uh, <clears throat> the per capita consumption there is enough scope like this is poultry we are talking about 2.6 kg per year for per capita consumption and for us it's around 50 kg and so where are we we are hardly anywhere 
and that's also shows us where what is the kind of scope of growth that can be there we are talking about milk again uh, we are almost half of that what is the per capita availability of milk in brazil so these are the segment which will be the key driver and i think the government is also focusing on on this thing and this will be the major uh, like um, especially dairy and poultry i think we we are still very optimistic on this two segment okay okay the next question is from mr jay kumar so this is uh, for both mr singh and mr soundarajan so we have a minimum population of veterinarians in the country uh, why we can educate all the interested persons to evaluate if he has a, if he have experience and non science students when they have not studied science in hsc or something like that so uh, in addition to this uh, do you think the new education policy will have uh, any scope for increasing the veterinarians in the country so mr soundarajan please yes and no we are not seen from government side a serious attempt towards the increasing the veterinarians hmm. the industry is not uh, one is the veterinarians it's a need for a skill level job there is a many many operation level jobs also it is the that the operation level it need not to be as a veterinarian but at uh, the same time the diploma and degree courses had to be brought in by the government many many professions are needed yes that show sure. but they are not with the background relevant education uh, is not there without that it's ha- happening that's why the we also we understood in about 6 uh, 7 years back this gap that's why we started our uh, institute also on poultry education okay so this mr. is the need of the work okay mr singh your take on this so uh, needed yes uh, at the same time we kind of follow a two pronged approach uh, understanding very well that potentially the number of veterinary colleges is not going to dramatically change or the capacity of these institutes is not going to dramatically change in next 5 to 10 years and maybe the demand will outstrip the supply that we have uh, uh i've kind of covered this in the way that you know we we are looking at developing a pool of para vets which start addressing uh, the more basic needs at the same time looking at technology to solve for this in the long term where our dependence on uh, talent pool potentially uh, remains restricted and we create this uh, more readily available technical solution or technological solution uh, which can scale up much faster than any of these conventional methods so i think uh, we need not think in more uh, conventional ways here uh, if this is a problem statement time and again many industries in last 5 or 10 years have gotten disrupted uh by uh, the ease with which technology can help scale some of the solutions we need to look at what which part of that solution uh, can get replicated in our industry and start working on that so we have one question from uh, professor m raman former director of uh, transnational research platform tanuvas chennai so with the growth of more incubators and fdi in the past few years how can both In the, in the country and overseas resources to be regulated and used for development of this often neglected sector is there a plan for utilization of such resources for development of animal husbandry more support beyond subsidies like increasing the quality of animal product in india is a need of the heart so your uh, comments from mr sondarajan yes it's happening here and there uh, uh, some the new thought process from the new gen people from the startups is happening now in poultry we are it's visible in uh, the marketing side okay now there's on today in about four five companies they are able to come with a platform and uh, they are able to reach out to the consumer directly but they are burning a lot of cash okay multinationals are investing into that companies and uh, their uh, huge money is uh, burned to acquire the uh, customers we have to wait and see the how the success uh, rate will be okay dairy sector also i hope it's happening uh, here and that that's uh, it's happening but not that much in the production side on uh, visibly okay so we have one question from mr shankar muttu krishnan in chromax biotech chennai this is uh, uh, for mr soundarajan so are we successful in identifying partial replacements for spm 
and what is the long term solution to protect the industry from volatility of field ingredient costs can you repeat the question are we are we successful in identifying the partial replacements for sbm and uh, what is the long term solution to protect the how the because of the what is what is the long term solution to protect the industry from volatility of feed ingredient costs right. maybe you can take that first and then for a soybean meal there is i can say that there's a king of the proteins as on today for poultry okay because other proteins is having its own negatives also okay that is unidentified toxins or uh, negative parameters are there if you are going to the groundnut cake the toxins are heavy then some of the materials it will be more in uh, fibrous some are with the heavy metals if it is going for a fish meal like that type of thing so i've been meal is the best of the proteins comparing with any other proteins but at the same time if you are going with the alternate proteins alternate proteins are having the problem of uh, tannins and other problems and it uh, leads to the productivity related problems as yes or now okay Okay, so so thank you, uh, Mr. Sandrajan. <clears throat> And the next question is from uh, Mr. V K Mohan. I feel with a lot of export thrust from government, if this can be properly addressed, we can get PL life for this industry for putting up the processing plants. So, Mr. Singh or Mr. Sandrajan, anybody can answer. You agree with the PLI? Of I don't think it's there. It's already there. The government has addressed that. Okay. Okay. And uh, next question. Like, so uh, next question is uh, to Mr. Singh. WHO has issued an advisory to the government of India to stop adulteration of milk and milk products. if not checked 87% of the citizens would be suffering from serious diseases like cancer by 2025 what's your take on how to stop adulteration in the milk segment i think part um, so let's also understand why this happens right i mean uh, one of the reasons why this happens is when the farm gate prices are very low that's when the farmer try i mean not the farmer but somebody in the entire value chain or in the entire supply chain decides to adulterate and make an extra buck so unless we keep the remuneration good enough across the value chain uh, adulteration will not be stopped uh, real time detection of adulteration is very critical to prevent this from uh, then uh, snowballing into a bigger problem down the uh, down the supply chain i think uh, there is lot of investments that dairy companies are making today to solve for this where uh, at the chilling center uh, there is uh, which is the first point of contact between the farmer and uh, a dairy organization uh, we start checking for the quality of milk uh, these are more deterrents these are the things that the industry is doing to ensure that the quality of milk flows but how do you incentivize the producer or if somebody else in the uh, uh, first let's address the producer part the remuneration of the milk has to be good for him to not do this and then once the milk is in the ecosystem of the organization then in that supply chain that quality control has to be strong enough to reject any such thing so is it needed yes if we want to become a serious exporter of any of the dairy producers uh, it could be smp and it could be higher value added products why restrict ourselves to only selling commodities if we have to be the next big cheese exporter and some of these things have to be solved for and uh, within the organization ecosystem i think uh, private and both uh, cooperatives have done enough and more and this is an iterative process working on it the only part where we need to now look at is how do we incentivize the farmer to not do it okay so one last question so this is from maruti rao jagdale so what are the challenges in ivf technology and then there is a related question from ravi e does sex genetics provide any sense in the dairy sector Oh, Mr. Singh, you can take that question. So I think sex genetics does provide a lot of sense uh, on both the counts. Uh, the uh, on AI, when you use sex semen, the results are promising. You don't get the unwarranted uh, male calf. Uh, the challenge, of course, there is you know you know the outcome only say uh, eight, ten months, ten months to eleven months, uh, nine to ten months down the line. 
where the big challenge that one has is you know that a lot of time and money has been invested only to know that the output is not favorable uh, so sex semen makes a lot of sense in ai uh, in embryo transfer technology we anyways uh, tend to produce uh, what is called as female calves or a cow in a cow concept right where we ensure that the embryo that is transferred into the mother is basically of a female so the probability of getting female improves to say 90% plus and this is something that we have seen in our own data of now more than uh, 200 plus uh, rather sorry 500 plus deliveries in last one and one and a half years that our uh, female conception rate or female delivery rate is around uh, 92% so yes sex semen has a big role to play it changes uh, the economics and dynamics the challenge in ivf technology is it's new for all of us uh, new in the sense the newness of the concept has not been really tested at the farm gate level so the quicker we reach with our offerings to the farmers at their doorsteps and are able to demonstrate this the reluctance to try this will be uh, removed and second is of course the cost component it's not a very affordable technology like ai but then the results far out or the benefits far outweigh the cost as far as uh, et is concerned so with this uh, we are run out of time and we have come to the end of this webinar so i would like to thank all the participants Mr. Nabi Kodraj, Mr. R. S. Sodi, Mr. Sandhurajan, Mr. Sandeep Singh, and Mr. Ashish Modani for for your all uh, enlightened uh, thoughts and in, interesting perspectives on the sector, playing in the sector. So thank you all. Hope we see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.